lot of law young lawyers who are not happy practicing law would love to go work for the commissioner of the NBA. How I, did you I, do that? I, honestly, I got incredibly lucky. You've said that players have um, depression and melancholy. They're no more immune from mental illness than any other sector of our society. You encourage your players to be involved in social media. It's in our business interest to demonstrate to our fans and the greater community these are multi-dimensional people. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it, it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist and nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? You have been the commissioner since 2014, and yeah. you had spent 22 years at the NBA offices before that. Right. And before that, you were a graduate of the two best schools to go to in combination, Duke University and the University of Chicago Law School, right? Which you happen to go to right, as well. Right, yeah. so uh, you can't do any better than that. Right. So let's just start with uh, the NBA today and how it's doing. And honestly, since you've been the commissioner, uh, the revenues are up, uh, ticket sales are up, the owner's value of their teams is up by about three times. So are you adequately paid for the job you're doing, do you think? <laughs> Today, um, the NBA is, seems to be at, at its at peak. It, right now, it's very popular all over the world. Why do you think it is that NBA basketball is so popular around the world, whereas our Major League Baseball and professional football isn't quite as global a sport? Well, I, I think part, part of the reason is that it's been an Olympic sport since the 1930s. I think that's made a big difference in that it's a sport that uh, has been played around the world. It was actually in, invented by Christian missionaries. In, you know, James Naismith was a Christian missionary, and the game was shortly after it was invented in Springfield, Massachusetts, brought to China. And so it's, it's been global since its earliest days. And, and I think when you think of the, t the two most popular global sports, I don't think it's an accident that both involve round balls, one you kick and one you shoot, use your hands. And I think there's almost something um, evolutionary about it, about round balls. And I, I think most people, even if you're not a basketball player, if, you know, whether it's your, you know, balling up paper and shooting it into a garbage can, or your little kid, I have a, I have a young daughter, when she sees a, a ball, she, she kicks it, or she picks it up and she throws it. So today, um, are there any more franchises that might be for sale, by the way? Is there any? Not that I'm aware of. Not that they're aware of, okay. But some of the people that have bought these franchises have done extremely well. Um, people bought, I think, the, like I said, the 76ers were bought a few years ago for three or four hundred million dollars, the Bucks for maybe four or five hundred million dollars. And when Steve Ballmer came in and paid $2 billion for the Clippers, were all the other owners happy because it made their, free, their team look more valuable or not? Yes, they were happy. And, uh, uh, okay. and uh, today. But, but, and, and since Steve bought the Clippers, two teams have sold for more than he paid, um, the Houston Rockets and the Brooklyn Nets. So one of the most difficult things you had to do after you became the commissioner was to, in effect, ban the then owner of the LA Clippers. Was that a tough decision for you? Um, the, yes, I mean, I, I, I think people may not realize it, but he's the only owner who's ever permanently been banned from a sport. Um, and it's, it's difficult because I, in essence, work for the owners. I work for the owners collectively. I don't work for any one owner, but my job is to do what's in the best interest of the league. And as people here may remember, that the tape that came out, the recording for which he was banned, came out um, you know, in, in the middle of the night, LA time, so I was in New York, so I didn't hear it till Saturday morning, and he was banned on Tuesday. So, I mean, there, it, he, he received NBA-style due process, right. but I think in most walks of life, people, you know, to think that from beginning to end that was four days well, is, was remarkable. Well, his, he, I think he paid probably less than $100 million when he bought the team uh, many, many years earlier. It was in San Diego then. I know that's the way you look at it, that, but he made but, a big profit. I know. So, <laughs> but my view is... But, is but the, uh, I, I don't think, frankly, from his standpoint, he's an extraordinarily wealthy guy, and um, 
I don't, I don't think his reaction was, look how much money I just made. The team was worth that regardless okay, of whether right. The family sold didn't it. call you up and say thank you for doing that. No, no they didn't no, do that. No. Okay. So, uh, but I understand that's how you look at it. <laughs> well, it's private equity. So one of the controversial things in college basketball has been the so-called one-and-done situation where college, uh, high school players go to college for one year, more or less, and then they get drafted into the NBA. Um, are you in favor of continuing that one-and-done policy, and, and what would you change it to if you did change it? it it's interesting. When, so when I first became commissioner um, five years ago, I announced that I thought the minimum age for entering the NBA should be 20 instead of 19. Roughly 11 years ago, we changed it from 18 to 19. And that has to be collectively bargained with our Players Association. So that's an area where I don't have the unilateral right to make a decision. I'd say then, once I became commissioner and, and, and became um, more aware of how the one and done situation was actually worked in, in operation, sort of how the recruiting worked, um, then there's obviously been some very high profile um, uh, uh, criminal proceedings around so, sort of college sports right now. And then in the middle of that, um, Mark Emmerich, the head of the NCAA, appointed a commission that included, uh, what was chaired by Condoleezza Rice, um, to look at lots of issues involving college sports, but particularly to focus on the one and done situation. And Con ultimately, Condoleezza Rice and her commission recommended to the NBA and our Players Association that we return to the 18-year-old um, entry age. And, and I would say that that had a huge impact on me. That together with a better understanding of what is happening to these top players in that it's, it's hard even to see it as a full year in many cases in college. Most of them leave once the tournament is over. I've changed my position to 18. The Players Association has historically been that it should be 18, but there are a bunch of issues that need to be worked through between us and the Players Association. So it's something we're in so active discussions with them. It's a couple years away from, a couple it's, years it's, away. It's a few years away. I think right. also, if we were to make the change, I think the right. first season that it would make sense to make that change for is 2022, in part because that's the current class that's just, in essence, finished their freshman year in high school. And the cohort is pretty well known. Uh, I mean. Lots of these young men may move from, you know, 10th projected pick to 3rd projected pick, but, the, but right. there aren't that many surprises in the cohort. And so if there was no longer an issue of eligibility, because remember now, because of NCAA, NCAA, NCAA regulations, we can't be involved with that cohort of players right now. So if, if the rule were to change, we and our Players Association, USA Basketball, other groups, would work much more directly with those young players to prepare them right. for the NBA at 18. You mean the one and dones after they finish the NCAA tournament, they're not finishing their classes? I don't want to say that's the case for all schools, um, but it's the case with many of those players, understandably, because um, the moment they fit, look, I, I think that's the whole hypocrisy in a way of, of the one and done program. Those top players are being recruited by those schools as the best path to being a top draft pick right. in the NBA. So once they, once they finish their collegiate career after one season, they are fully focused on preparing for the right. NBA draft. So whether or not right. they're still going to some classes, and remember, I mean, just to put it in context, for a player coming into, for a, a, a top player coming into the NBA, let's say a top 10 pick that's gonna come into next year's draft, given our pay scale now, and assuming the NBA continues to, to prosper, and assuming that player stays healthy and, and plays around where the expectation is that player will play, that player, just in salary alone, is going to make well over $200 million. So, um, well, let's talk about that. So, the, so the, the stakes, uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard, I think, if you were that parent or guardian to say to that player, it's more important that you go to three more classes as opposed to preparing for such a critically right. important decision. I think it's, it, I, I, and I think that's where the hypocrisy lies. Would you like to own a piece of the betting profits in the league? It, not the profits. I think our proposal is, um, I mean, it's been a bit controversial, but you know, we've proposed that we receive something that, that I've called an integrity fee. Your referees are, they seem to be in pretty good shape. They're sometimes they're, you know, not 20 years old, but they seem to be, you require them to exercise a lot. They don't seem to have pot bellies. They seem to be really in good shape. 
they. I hope that's not the best you can say about them. Well, they, uh, well, they, they, they know the rules. They don't too, have but, pot uh, bellies. Well, they seem to be in, for, for guys their age. They seem to be in pretty good shape. But uh, yeah, I think so. Are, are there women referees? Yeah, there? absolutely. By the way, that's we have um, we have three female referees right now, and I think it's an area, frankly, where I've acknowledged that I'm not sure how it was that it remained so male dominated for so long mm -hmm. because it's an area of the game where um, the physically. Certainly, it, there's no benefit to being a man as opposed to a woman when it comes to refereeing. And in fact, uh, you know, we're now, in terms of the last group of referees that we hired into the league, and they came from our, our development league, is, our, is, is called our G League, um, the, the two of the last five officials that came in were women. And the, and the goal is, going forward, it should be roughly 50-50 okay. of new officials entering the league. Okay, so let's talk about um, one serious issue that uh, I didn't really address before. Uh, you've said that players have um, depression and melancholy, and they feel isolated. Uh, can you explain? You know, somebody's making uh, fifty million dollars a year. They seem to be, you know, well respected by everybody. Why are they so depressed and isolated? Well, in, in all seriousness, what I've said is that it, when I in, in talking about our players, I said they're no more immune from mental illness than any other sector of our society. And I think I'm sure people in this room know families firsthand that regardless of how much money you're making or your position in life or your family, that in some cases it's chemical, in some cases it's environmental, but that it cuts across, okay. you know, Okay. All socioeconomic groups, and and what's changing though in our league, and 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 again, I think this is it's it's wonderful that that players are now willing to talk about these things. We had two high-profile players, Demar Derozan when he was still with the Raptors, and, and Kevin Love on the Cleveland Cavaliers, who came out publicly and said they were suffering from depression and had issues with anxiety. You know, and I know firsthand they weren't the first players in our league suffering with issues like those, but they were certainly the first players, while they were current players in the NBA, to talk about it. And I think what, what, what and, and I've heard from so many mental health professionals that when, it really goes to the, to the heart of your question, when people who are perceived as having everything, and then especially in something, in professional sports where there's a certain machoism associated with it and, and a certain perceived toughness that, and, and I think the, the stigma historically has been suck it up, right? And you're not right. tough if, 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 if you're dealing with something that's not physical. And where, you know, when originally our, our junior basketball programs were literally just about basketball skills, like keep your elbow in and shoot this way, and this is how you play defense. And then we morphed those programs into more about physical fitness in addition to basketball skills. And now in the last year, we've added a mental mm -hmm. wellness component. It's been incredibly well received by people throughout the country, you know, who, because who, I know from the letters we get and from the mental health professionals we work with that kids are now coming in and saying, wow, this NBA player is able to, you know, raise their hand and say, you know, I'm suffering, I need help. You know, regular kids feel comfortable doing that so, as well. So, um, if you are, let's suppose, um, <laughs> but the, the Supreme Court has said that sports betting is more or less uh, going to be legal, essentially it's legal. So are, is, are you worried that in the 1950s and so in the college sports, we had uh, sports betting shaving? Uh, people were, because of the odds or relating to the, the, the point spread. Are you worried about that uh, in the NBA? I, I'm, I'm always worried that we could have a, a, a scandal of, of any kind, certain, certainly one involving sports betting. I think that we are better off with a regu regulated betting framework than keeping it all underground and illegal. And I know firsthand as the league that, you know, it's the Supreme Court decision has only been in, within the last year, and now something like eight states have now legalized sports betting. I, I, my, our preference would be that there would be a consistent federal right. framework because if you're a league and you're potentially dealing with 50 different states and all their different requirements, it becomes a huge burden for the business, and it's also a bit of a race to the bottom among the states sometimes from a regulatory standpoint. But putting that aside, I, in terms of our concern that like any public market, just if you think of NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, part of their ability to, to ferret out illegal activities from the algorithms that, that show when there's um, deviations that, that, that cause their computers to, to, to you know, issue red flags and say something aberrational has happened here. When everything's illegal, other than having 
in essence, tipping services and relationships, we can't know those things. So, so I think it's better that it be transparent, regulated, you know, and controlled and authenticated. And this way also people are betting with their credit cards so you know who they are. And there's, it, it's been not only legal in obviously the state of Nevada for a long time, but in, for decades in Europe. And I've learned a lot from our counterpart soccer leagues because they're, they've worked and, and lived in regulated betting frameworks for a long time and they have much better controls than we so do. Would, would you like to own a piece of the betting profits in the league? You, not the profits. I think our proposal is, um, I mean, it's been a bit controversial, but you know, we've proposed that we receive something that, that I've called an integrity fee. And some people said, oh, that's a euphemism for you just getting a royalty. And I'm saying, all right, call it a royalty. You know, my view is this, this year, the NBA will spend roughly $8 billion creating the NBA. I mean, we'll generate around $9 billion and we spend about $8 billion. And my feeling is as the creators of the intellectual property, and the organization in which the burden of regulation has been imposed on us by the states. I mean, again, this is, you know, the, the Supreme Court did what it did, and now states are doing what they're doing, legalizing sports betting. They are now imposing a set of requirements on us in terms of how they expect us to protect the integrity of the product. And, and so my view is we should get a, a, a fee not off the profits, because I don't want anyone to think in any way that we're incentivized for a particular team to win or for a game to go or for a particular score or for a, you know a, a seven games instead of six games or whatever else. But yes, I feel as a business matter, we should share in the proceeds. David Stern was a spectacular commissioner by everybody's account. He did it for 30 years. I think he retired when he was like 72. So were you, when he was 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, did you say, David, maybe I'm ready? Did you ever give him a little push or how did that happen? Never, never, never. How do you get to be NBA commissioner, um, really? Um, do you, I mean, did you grow up saying, I want to be NBA commissioner? I, I didn't grow up wanting to be the commissioner. I don't even think I had any sense of you what went to it Duke, was. But you did not go to Duke on a basketball scholarship. I, I definitely didn't. And, and I, I'm pretty sure that when, even when I went to law school, I, if somebody had asked me what the NBA commissioner did, I would have said he hands out, ring, he hands out rings and, you know, and sets the schedule. I wouldn't really have un, even understood the job. So you graduated from the University of Chicago Law School. You clerked for a federal judge. I did. Then you went to Cravath, Swain & Moore, a well-known Wall Street firm. And then how did you go from there to the NBA? Uh, because a lot of law, young lawyers who are not happy practicing law would love to go work for the commissioner of the NBA. How I, did you do I, that? I, honestly, I got incredibly lucky. I, um, I had worked at Cravath for about two years and decided that I, I was working. One of, at the time, one of um, Cravath's big clients was Time Warner. And I was doing working on a lot of media cases and at the time for HBO in particular. And I became fascinated with the media business. And uh, while I was working on a particular litigation, I was following what was happening in sports media and, and the, the move of sports to cable television, really, you know, and it was Ted Turner in essence, through TBS and then TNT, who was leading that charge. And um, David Stern, um, then the commissioner, was at the forefront of that movement. And David Stern had worked at Proskauer in New York, which was the same law firm that my father had worked at. And I didn't know David, but I wrote him a letter and asked him if he could give me some advice about transitioning from law into a media job at the time, having written the letter, not even thinking about working at the NBA or understanding what, that, that this was something I could do at the NBA. Um, make a long story short, he gave me, he, he you know, this is pre-email. He, 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 I wrote him a letter, an old-fashioned letter. His assistant called me a few weeks later, said he can see you on whatever date. I went over, I met with him for a half hour. He gave me some advice, which I didn't follow. Right. And, and then about a month later, he called me and he said, what are you up to? And he said, I have an idea. And after a series of meetings, he hired me as his assistant. And that was my first now, job. Now, if you got NBA. a letter from a young lawyer today, what would you seek that I, kind of I'd advice? I'd pass it to our HR department. <laughs> and, uh, all right, so David Stern, uh, David Stern was a spectacular commissioner by everybody's account. He did it for 30 years, and I think he retired when he was like 72. So 
were you, when he was 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, did you say, David, maybe I'm ready? Did you ever give him a little push, or how did that happen? Never, never, never. And, and again, I was, I, being commissioner of the NBA is my sixth job at the NBA, and so for five of those jobs, I worked directly for David. And he gave me enormous opportunity. He's a brilliant guy. Um, I ended up running a, a, an entity called MBA Entertainment. I was interested in the media business, sort of the, the television and media, and then became the internet arm of the NBA. Many years later, I became the deputy commissioner of the NBA. But ultimately, you know, David could recommend me, but it required the, the, right. the team owners voting me. That's how the commissioner is determined. And he sort of set his own timeline for when he was going to step down. And I think also I was very fortunate that the league was in great shape at that moment. I assume there could have been a scenario where if things weren't going so well, they might have looked outside the NBA. But again, I, I, I owe a lot to David, and I was very fortunate to be in that job. So what do you think is the leadership trait that you had that enabled David to you know, think you deserve to be the commissioner? Um, I, I, I think, you know, it, it, Nothing necessarily so unique to me. I, I, I was willing to work very hard, and I did work very hard over the years. I, I certainly love the sport of basketball. I, I think that much of my job now is spent on media. It's the primary revenue source right. for the NBA. So the fact that I developed an expertise in media over the years was very important. I'd say I think while you'd, certainly being a lawyer isn't a prerequisite to being um, a NBA commissioner, no different than being a lawyer, I, I, obviously in your job, but I think you and I would say the same thing. I think, I think you'd say the same thing. Having gone to law school, learning those skills has been very beneficial. A large part of my job is being a professional negotiator, whether it's collective bargaining, whether it's commercial relationships that we enter into. So I think it was, it was all of those skills. A lot of your media today, and this is contrast you with the other leagues, is social media. You encourage your players to be involved in social media. Uh, you encourage uh, LeBron James, your best known players, to really be, if not controversial, to have public views. Why do you, th why do, you do that, and has it been helpful to the NBA? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, certainly don't um, encourage them to be controversial. I encourage them to be genuine and earnest about their views, and I make sure that they know that, that within certain boundaries, frankly, I mean, I think there's still more around issues of decency, not particularly political speech, but I want them to know that they should feel safe, frankly, as NBA players. And I ultimately think it's in our business interest to demonstrate to our fans and the greater community these are multi-dimensional people, that earlier on in my career at the NBA, I think when we had the biggest issues as a league, and this was before there was that opportunity with social media, for players to um, have that ability to, to show who they are directly to fans, they were portrayed in many cases as being one-dimensional right. people. They were just sort of just ball players, and people didn't understand, you know, that where they were from and what they did and what their other interests were, and, or if, if, they were, if they were from other countries, they were just from China. There was no sense, well, it's a big place, they're from Beijing, and this is what they did, and this is how they grew up. And I think social media, as a complement to the traditional media, which is really helpful too, allows them to show who they really are, and I think it helps to engage fans. Who's the game. best player in the NBA? <laughs> no. There's many great players in the NBA, David. Okay. And now you have recently married a couple years ago, right? Uh, four years ago. Four yes. years ago. Yeah. And now you have a baby who is? Two years old. A little, old. little old, over two. And is she interested in basketball? Absolutely. And, she uh, watches, and that's why I got to make sure the WNBA mm -hmm. prospers. She's, my wife is tall. I'm tall. She, uh, she watches basketball games with me. And I may get some tips from uh, our, our, our other Coach K here in the audience. Uh, and uh, um, I, I would love to coach her one day. It's sort of, uh, right. you so know, I, I want, she loves the game, I'd love her. So She's you're, gonna stay, you're gonna stay in this position for the foreseeable future. You're not gonna go buy a team, go into private equity, nothing like that. You're gonna stay. No, no plans to go anywhere. All right, thank you very much for an interesting conversation. Thank you, David.